So why is 4.0 close to my heart? I actually started my career in the first wave implementing 4.0 for a lot of big multinational companies. I work with companies as Maersk, Lego, Novo Nordisk, Toyota and others, basically rolling out their multinational applications uh, across 30 to, to, to 40 countries in the world. Um, now we are moving into the second wave of 4.0, basically where it's not only about back office processes or about efficiency, but basically of changing the whole business concept. Um, I spent my first uh, uh, 15 years uh, working in the ICT companies, both from uh, IBM to Oracle, over building my own, a couple of companies on my own, uh, traveling across borders. And then uh, I went more and more into policy, working with the foreign office, export uh, policy, foreign policies and growth policies. Um, so this is why I'm very happy to be here today and, and to share a little bit what's going on on, uh, on the policy agendas of 4.0. So what is Digital Europe? Basically, Digital Europe would, is the main association of uh, both uh, national uh, EU, uh, European associ IT association. We have 40 members, uh, 40 association around in Europe who are members. and. Um, and as you hear, see here, the three organizers are all members of Digital Europe, so thank you for inviting me here today uh, to those associations. Um, this means that we are quite uh, powerful in the way that we say we have people on ground. So one thing is having people in Brussels, but if we, I always say that the vision is to bring the people or the companies to Brussels and the Brussels to the companies. And link, making that link between the legislation and regulatory work in Brussels to the countries. And this is our secret weapon, this is how we do it. It works extremely well and we meet every uh, three months with all the European companies to try to harmonize our views on how to go forward with the digitalization in Europe. Second of all, we have a lot of direct members uh, in another chamber. Several of them is here today. Siemens and others are rep also represented um, in, in amongst the audience and speakers today. Okay, so let's look a little bit. I mean, uh, we all know that the world is changing. And uh, what is it that uh, you know, the digitalization really demands? First of all, clearly we work with innovation. There is no doubt that AI, IoT, and the whole wave of new technologies will change not only the, how we work in, within the private sector, but also how we work within the public sector. And uh, regulators sometimes uh, have a hard time f uh, catching up with, uh, with the speed of the private sector changes. And if you look at Europe, basically we're a club of 27, 8, 7 countries that has to form a common market. This is not easy. There is one big game changer of dig digitalization. Before, production was all about scale of production. Input, cheap, high quality input, high quality output, and then you go and conquer the market. But there was a value chain, there was a physical product, uh, and a whole value chain until it reached the customers. If you look at a lot of the services who are transforming their, their industry today, they are non-tangible. It's not the product that really makes the difference, it's the data. It is the services around the data that surrounds the product that really differentiate the industry going forward. And these are some of the game changers that will change how we work and how we sell our products, but also it will define the winners and the losers. Because if we are not able to scale up in the European market with a speed, with a huge harmonized home market, well, I can tell you that there are other regions that can actually do so. If we look at the American market, it functions as one homogeneous market. If we look at the Chinese market, huge home market. Then we look at Poland, okay, it's a bigger country than Denmark, where I'm from. But it is a small country seen if you are a company that wants to conquer the world with your products. And in the world of digitalization, scale matters. It is the scale of market, not of products. It is the scale of market and how fast you can actually win a market share. 
Second of all, the game changer here is you know the development, how it went. First, we had the machines. They helped us basically to grow the land and be more efficient in the physical world. Then we had the machines really, again, taking us to the next level. Then we had the PC, right? It actually changed the fact that we don't have to be physical present, but we can work from some and communicate from anywhere that we want. But now the, the fourth layer is we don't even have to think. I mean, half of the processes that we do today that we thought were, was actually dedicated to human beings, we don't have to do those anymore. We have chess machines that have started actually making in irrational moves. We cannot explain why, but they have learned to think logically and even illogically. People get a little bit scared of this. I would say we have a choice now. We have a choice of actually taking technology to the benefit of our society, so I don't think we need to be scared. It is the same, you know, we said, well, the PC, our youngsters, they will never talk to each other anymore, they will be, you know, not very social people. It never happened, right? And this won't happen either if we make sure that we take it in the wrong, right direction. But it is a radical, revolutionary change that it's not only the physical world that the technology helps, it's actually also our, our, uh, our psychological ability to and mental uh, capacity that is widening now. We know that AI and IoT will basically change the economy. And without, uh, without data, these two things are nothing. They are empty words which means that now we have different kinds of challenges in industry. It's all about free flow data. Will you as a company be able to take data from one country to another? Will it only be within the EU? Will some countries actually say, no, we don't want to share our data with other countries, and by then really putting what we call data localization and discrimination. So data ha has the potential of becoming one, the biggest growth factor at all in industry, but also, two, an increasing uh, threat of, of protectionism that countries try to control the data. So as an industry, of course, we would really like free flow of data, the more the merrier, because it gives our companies the ability to grow across border. It's also very exciting to see that, you know, uh, if we look at the investments, it is mainly the big tech giants that, in, that are investing right now in AI and IoT, and the startups and smaller companies are really lacking behind. So I will return to that in a second with the European investment plan. Also, we know that for the existing industries, 75% of the value added is actually created by non-traditional services, so uh, by the internet uh, and, and by, uh, by technology. It means that basically right now the only growth factor left for existing industries is technology. And I'm sure I don't, I'm speaking to, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the converted here, but it's important to understand that digital policies and digital investments are actually key for the growth of also traditional uh, companies. So, okay, a little bit about what we do on this. Uh, I have been a part of the commission group who has uh, been defi uh, defining the investment strategy and what we call the key enabling technologies. In the past, those were a lot on advanced materials and, and other very good technologies. But what wasn't in there? There was no AI, there was no data, uh, data technologies, there was no um, advanced connectivity. And these key enabling technologies basically also kind of pushes where the EU investment goes. So right now, uh, luckily, it's, it's launched. It was launched last week, and we have advanced connectivity and uh, uh, as as an uh, investment factor, 5G, uh, AI, and uh, and cybersecurity technologies in there as investment uh, areas of the Commission. So hopefully, we can work together and really push towards. Uh, that we fix the basics, because it's very nice to, in, to invest and to do research in very advanced and technologies, but you know, as, uh, as Kane said, in the long run we are all dead, right? So basically, in the next 20 years or even 10 years, we need to focus at the factors that actually changes our industry right now. 
This is also why Digital Europe, um, see if I can point with this one. I'm not sure I can. I'm not going to dare it. I can't. Okay, we work basically with our competence areas, which is privacy and security, digital enterprise, digital skills and job. We are the home of the, the biggest uh, skills co coalition in Europe. Uh, several of the, the Polish um, members are also members there. And basically, um, enhancing digital skills and job creation in all the European countries. Um, and uh, making sure that investment flows in the future framework, I predict that there will be an increasing investment in di digital and jobs creation, both on school level, but definitely also directly towards industry. And, uh, and there is no doubt that the Commissioner Gabrielle has made it her hard course, basic to, to make sure that industry has the possibility of reskilling their, their workforce um, to the new digital age. Without the digitalization or the digital skills, well, uh, it's a little bit hard to see how we're going to change the, the, the society for a high growth competitive society. Um, and then we work with all the sectors. We work with the uh, manufacturing sector and, uh, and the finance sector and, and the health sector, basically to, to, uh, to support them also digitalizing and, and making a, a regulatory framework fit for their growth. Okay, the digital skills, I touched upon it a bit before. Um, I think we can say that, uh, I'm going to be a bit provocative here, <laughs> I, say that I, I think we can say that is where governments failed the most. Um, we have sticked to uh, teaching our kids the same as we did 20 years ago, using the same methods. And then there was a period where we said, why don't we give them all an iPad? So again, I know that we might be advanced to countries, but the Nordics, everybody had an iPad. But I have to tell you, getting an iPad doesn't solve anything. You know, the two years old can use an iPad. And uh, if I look at my five teenagers at home, they can use any kind of device. But if you ask them how it's made, they have no clue. They don't have the slightest idea. If you ask them, do you know what coding is or programming is? They have no idea. They don't have the slightest idea. Maybe they saw something in a movie with a geek in the basement that stole some kind of data from the other, but they don't know. And we kind of left a generation behind, um, and I'm sorry to say that it is my, my kids' generation that we left behind. They, have, they don't have the skills to be creators of technology, and coding and programming is the only international language that we have. It's bigger than English, it's bigger than Chinese, it's bigger than Spanish. And how come that we actually have a school system that, don't, that doesn't teach our kids, our young people, the basic skills of what they spend eight hours a day looking at? This is what we need. We need to give them the, the, the skills and understanding on how to be creators and not just to be users. Because if, if not, then we have other continents being the creators and the ones who are taking the world in that direction. So digital skills, both in, in the classroom, but basically also you know, giving the opportunity and the investment capital for businesses to reskill their, their workforce towards having digital skills uh, is extremely important and one of our main agendas. Okay, I will move it on. Um, moving a bit to a digital secure system. So uh, I would say these two are, the digital secure uh, um, infrastructure is basically extremely linked. One, we have a high-speed digital highway of 5G and a secure environment with, uh, with cybersecurity uh, technology that makes sure that, that uh, they, we can actually rely on it. Well, then we have the base of the investment and the growth of the rest of the industry. Right now, well, if you are lucky and you are a big, uh, powerful company, you can actually maybe pay your way out of it. But if we really want the whole European society to grow, number one, I think there's two main drivers, that we actually get investment and a European seamlessly strong, secure infrastructure in place, ASAP. We are far, 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 far behind uh, US and China and now Korea also. And, uh, you know, per capita, US actually invests the double uh, per capita in, in 5G. So this is, this is really 
number one. Number two is getting the digital skills to actually make that change in society. Um, okay, so I mean, in a lot of numbers, I'm happy to share it with you, but, but it, uh, you know, everybody predicts that, that really the investment in the infrastructure is the one that will boost our growth because it gives basically the foundation for, uh, for all companies and for society to create growth. I was just on the Mobile World Congress, and I must say, um, my, my conclusion is. Uh, the industry is ready. There is a, you know, a growing uh, alliance between companies and infrastructure providers, and, uh, and we are really re ready for the takeoff. Now we just meet, ne need to make sure that we harmonize across the European countries, and instead of kind of staying in our small cocoons of uh, Poland and Denmark and Germany, basically align it and have that one market, harmonized market in Europe. If not, we don't have scale. And we need scale. There, the, I'm telling you, the other guys have scale. We need that too, and only if we stick together we can have that. Um, let me go on with this. A little bit on Poland. I wanted, to, uh, I wanted to share a couple of figures with you, and maybe you already know. But um, Poland is actually one of the kind of growth cradles of Europe. Yes, Poland is behind on infrastructure. Yes, you are. Um, but there is actually a very, very fast uptake of what we call the data economy. Um, if we look at your concrete uh, placement in, uh, in the digitalization uh, index, well, it's not really that good. But now is the good news. If we look at your, uh, your growth rate, basically, you're growing much faster than the rest of Europe. And if we look f further down uh, towards how the, the data market is, is being adopted, we have a huge growth rate. So your, your companies and their ability to basically create new data, um, data-based or data-generated services is amazing. And if we look at the amount of companies that have been actually created in this period, it's booming here. So I would like to say, I mean, as a part of uh, being a strong European uh, myself, uh, for me, Poland is one of the main drivers in the European um, collaboration. It is a very close uh, you know, ally and, and a growth engine for the rest of Europe. And, uh, and hopefully, this trend will spread to, uh, to the rest of Europe and we can adopt your, your rates of, of, uh, of adoption of data economy uh, into the rest of Europe. And hopefully, by then, then we will start having harmonization of the regulatory environment and investment into the European environment that makes it possible for these companies not to be sold only to foreign vendors, but actually to stay in Poland and to grow. I visited a couple of companies yesterday, very successful Polish companies, who has been basically growing all over Europe. I think that's impressive. Unfortunately, we see that two-thirds of these kind of companies, they grow to the second or the third growth phase, and then they get, get purchased by foreign uh, companies. And that's not bad. It's actually, I mean, that's a natural thing. We need both. But we really need to sustain also a European base of growth companies who stay and grow within Poland, within Europe. And, and that at the moment is, is, quite, is not good results. After 2008, a lot of the companies have been sold at a very, very early stage. So, so we need to push for basically harmonization of the European market for these companies to grow across uh, uh, Europe, a strong investment in 5G and connectivity, so we make sure that they stay here and they work with the traditional industries on digitalization, and then, of course, to make sure that our young generation gets the right skills to actually make that transformation and that growth in the society. So, I mean, you're not that bad off, and uh, we, I'm a little bit jealous of your growth rates here. I would like to see it in the rest of the Europe. Um, and I would say the main point is uh, industry seems to be ready. Now we just need to see an unfragmented uh, regulatory environment across Europe and a huge investment in the 5G that really, um, that really makes the foundation of that growth. 
Okay, thank you so much for listening to me and uh, uh, I hope that I have inspired you a little bit. I will stick around for, for a while also for the panel and, uh, and take some questions. Thank you.